to the Booster Pack. This is the show where we unwrap the stories and crack the mysteries of collectible game history. My name is Rans, and today our guest is no stranger to making gaming history. That's right, he is one of the earliest and most prolific contributors to fantasy hobby gaming that has ever lived. His history in this industry stretched his back to the dawn of the role-playing game, and he is even the father of the science fiction RPG. A lot of his legacy comes from his time working with his friend Gary Gygax at one of the most influential gaming companies the world has ever known, the original publisher of Dungeons & Dragons, TSR. Now, not only is he a progenitor of the hobby gaming as we know it, he is also an accomplished author, magazine editor, and an inductee into the Adventure Gaming Hall of Fame. And as much as I would love to continue listing his accolades, we only have so much time. He is also here today to talk about his time as a collectible card game designer, starting his work at TSR in pioneering space after Magic the Gathering comes out to release the second ever collectible card game, Spellfire. And shortly after that in his career, he has also worked on what is arguably the largest anime franchise the world has ever known, crafting his own original CCG. That is Dragon Ball Z. Now, I guess today I am honored to welcome the absolute legend of tabletop gaming and of course, Drawmage the Wizard himself. That is our friend, Jim, James M. Ward. Jim, how are you? I'm very fine, thank you. That was a terrific intro. Thank you very much. Well, it's, uh, it's quite a legacy that you're, uh, you've got. Um, so I wanted to get to know, you know, what, um, what got you into those amazing accomplishments? Like, I want to start even before maybe role-playing games came along. Were you, like, growing up into uh, games and, like, fantasy settings? Well, my, my dad taught me how to play poker when I was eight to, to, get, to get back my allowances. So we played a lot of games back in the day, but uh, I do have a favorite story to tell about me meeting Gary Gygax. Oh, please do. So, so if you'll put up with it for a few minutes, um, basically the time is 1974. I just graduated from college with an education degree. I wanted to be a teacher. And every Tuesday I would go to the Lake Geneva bookstore. And because on Tuesdays they got science fiction and fantasy books. I was a big fan of both. So I, on one Tuesday in the summer, I got got to the store and I started picking up books. And by the time I was done, I had seven books in my hand. They were like um, Conan the Barbarian and, and Andrea Norton and a couple of her books. Um, basically there were seven books. And I looked over to my right and there was this biker dude and he was grabbing books from the from the story. He had a blue jean jacket. He had ripped pants. He had big biker boots on. He had one of those. He had one of those wallets with the chain sticking out of the side of the pocket. And he had a great big beard and glasses. And he just kind of looked like a rough dude. Right. But when he got done with the same row I got done with, we both had the exact seven books in our hand. Wow. Which I know we laughed about that. Thought it was very strange. <laughs> we got talking about writing and what we like to read. And he said he had a game where I could play Conan the Barbarian and mm-hmm. fight set. Oh, and, okay. and I was hooked like a fish right there. Right. <laughs> a couple weeks what? later, I went to his house and his porch and Gary Gygax taught me how to play D&D um, with a brown box set. Wow. Yeah, I know. And the rest is kind of history. Was the first character you played, did you actually play Conan and he he, uh, rolled it up for you? No, no, no. I I started out as a wizard. I rolled uh, a real high intelligence. So I started out as a wizard and I've been playing wizards for 45 years now, ever since. I just love playing wizards and casting spells. That's fantastic. That's amazing that you met a uh, an intimidating looking fellow who I'm afraid would uh, would beat me up in the alley out the back and you ended up, you know, starting a lifelong friendship with him. Yep, he looked like he could too. He was he looked really rough, but he he was a great guy and I learned a lot from him. Wow, and all the photos I've seen of uh, a Gary Gygax, he looks like he has a heart of gold, but I can imagine if he's got a chain on his wallet and uh big biker boots on, he would uh he could definitely impose an intimidating stature. Indeed. So that ends up eventually, I mean, we're probably skipping forward a little bit, but you end up working for him and making role-playing games yourself. Well, 
what what wound up happening is that uh, I, I got a teacher job in Prairie du Chien and started teaching history and English. But mm -hmm. every holiday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, summer break, I would go down um, with my parents and my family would come down and I would play D&D &D with Gary. Right. And for about three months, we, we played and had a great deal of fun. And I told Gary, Gary, you need to have a science fiction version of this game. And Gary said, you know, Jim, I just don't have the time to do it right now. I'm working on a bunch of modules that have to get out. If I'm going to make D&D popular, why don't you give it a try? Well, he amazed me with that offer, and I wasn't going to refuse, I'll tell you. So for the next three months, I worked on Metamorphosis Alpha, and, uh, and I got down the, the, the main points of it, and then Gary, Brian Bloom, and I started playtesting my version of Metamorphosis Alpha. Wow. So had you, other, like, had you been quite the GM before that, or had you made a few of your own? No, no. I hadn't been a dungeon master at all. So this is sort of like straight in the deep end, trial by fire. Yes, exactly right. He, he threw me in the deep end to swim or sink, and, and I wound up doing pretty good. The game is still out today. You can get it at Goodman Games and, and buy the exact same version. And, uh, and so, yeah, it, it's had a long history, and I'm really pleased with it. I'm always doing more product on it. That's amazing. Well, that's, uh, that's something we'll talk about later, and we brought it up in the intro. As I said, the father of uh, science fiction RPGs, Metamorphosis Alpha there. So, um, so eventually end up working for Gary's company, um, TSR, which is putting out um, Dungeons and Dragons products and having a phenomenal time throughout the 1980s, selling tons of, tons of modules, tons of books, players' handbooks, monsters' manuals, all sorts of stuff. Do you have any favorite memories from your time working with Gary and at TSR during the 80s, during that high time for the company? Oh, that's an interesting question. I did an awful lot of product. Oh, yeah. Demigods came out, Gods, Demigods and Heroes came out. Um, uh, I, it was fun going to conventions too. It, it teaching people how to play the game is, is just very enjoyable, and I and I enjoyed it a ton. Um, we we had our problems though. We we had the religious group thinking that D and D was was evil, and uh, and D and D was used to summon devils and demons. It's totally ridiculous, but we, we managed to fix that problem. We, we were clever about it. And, uh, and so, yeah, during the 80s, it was real, real good for us, except 1984, a bunch of us got fired from TSR. Um, I fell in the third of five purges, but, but eventually I kept doing products for the book department. And eventually a wise accountant said, you know, we're paying Jim so much money in royalties we should pay him a salary and we won't have to pay him as much. And so, and so that's what they did. They hired me back and, and I started working for them again. And, and it was just a good time. It was, I, I like to compare it to, to Camelot. It was, it was my um, Camelot time because it was just very exciting. We were at the top of the heap. Everybody wanted to work at TSR um, because the company was the biggest, biggest in the, in the hobby industry. And so on basically all of the 80s and through most of the 90s, TSR was the big deal. So the 80s is going along and uh, despite, the, um, despite the religious backlash that you guys did suffer um, that has been very publicized, you guys made it through and you are one of the four premier gaming formats for the entire hobby. And that continues throughout the 80s into the 90s. Uh, in 1989, obviously Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, uh, second edition comes out. Um, then a couple of years later, something big changes the industry. Um, something that I'm quite a fan of, but obviously it would have been such a new shock to hobby games at the time. Uh, Magic the Gathering lands uh, in 1993. Do you have any memories of how you first learned about that? Oh, yeah, I do. But let me tell you just a little story before then. Okay, so Avalon Hill and SPI um, in the very early 70s came out with war game products. And they sold great and they built a big fan group. Um, but, but the game would take three or four hours to set up and eight or nine hours to play and another two hours to put away. So then Gary, then Gary comes out in 1974 with a game that just takes a couple hours to play. And there's no setup time and there's no breakup time. So the role playing industry kind of took over from the war game industry. All right. And so we sailed along on, until the 90s when when. Wizards of the Coast came out with Magic the Gathering and and the 
the Magic the Gathering took even a shorter time to learn how to play and and even a shorter time to play. And so it took over from role playing. Right, right. It sort of was the new dog. Yes, exactly. And so it should be very and, and I'm thinking um, today and today's climate, uh, maybe online gaming is going to take over from from wizards and from role playing. But uh, but basically, it uh, it was introduced at Origins, and I bought a couple decks of Magic: The Gathering, and uh, and the rules were terrible. The rules were really terrible, and the decks were terrible. Mm -hmm. They fixed all that um, after after a year of being very popular and coming out with great stuff. They they mm -hmm. definitely fixed the rules, and they definitely fixed the decks that you bought. So in the first decks, you know you couldn't put much together. You know you you got a mm -hmm. bunch of of uh, fire lands, and you didn't get any fire creatures, or you mm -hmm. got a bunch of green land, and you didn't get any green creatures. But that mm -hmm. got fixed in the decks, and and they they steadily improved, and they're still improving. I'm I'm glad to say that they're uh, they're going to do Forgotten Realms. Um, yeah. in, their, in their decks of cards, which I think is a brilliant idea. I su mm -hmm. actually suggested that to them um, in, in 98. Really? Yeah, yeah, I suggested that, that would be a good idea. That's amazing. So if, as I mentioned in the intro, you're actually represented in a d, &D um campaign yourself, obviously, Greyhawks, there's the Drawmage the Wizard, which is Jim Ward backwards. How would you feel if in a future set they bring out a Greyhawk set and your character has a card? Well, that would be wonderful. I mean, I, I would find it vastly amusing, actually. Um, um, but but I'd like to point out that those bad guys, I, when I started my own little company called Fast Forward, I put Dromage in one of my adventures. And, and their lawyers sent me a cease and desist letter saying they owned Dromage and I didn't own my name backwards and we couldn't print product on it. Oh, that's ridiculous. I, I was really silly. And I have to say, I, I, I just didn't have the lawyers to, to fix it. But I've, I've always been irritated by that. That That is so unusual, especially in gaming. Everything is, the gaming industry is obviously very, um, uh, very well known for being a sort of community of, of gamers first. And unfortunately, that does not, that doesn't sound like that, um, that value was held true with that, with that case. You know, I understand the, the concept of protecting your copyrights and trademarks. But it, it's a name that they don't use at all. And it's my name backwards. So I'm just, I wasn't pleased with the whole deal. Okay, well, we'll jump back. Let's jump way back to um, back to 1993. You said you bought some decks, you played a little. Um, did you, in gen like in those first couple of months, um, you obviously had a positive impression of the game? Well, yeah, here's the deal. I knew this was going to be a big, big deal. And, and I, I didn't know it was going to be, a multi-million dollar company, but I knew it was going to be a big deal. So I went to TSR and I told, I told my bosses, Hey, this is a, this is going to be a gigantic thing. We need to do our own card game. And, and they, they scoffed at me. Lorraine Williams said, Oh no, Magic the Gathering isn't going to go anywhere. Wizards of the Coast will be closed down in six months. Right. So let me jump back a bit. So so you're saying that Lorraine, the um, the head of of dungeons, well of TSR, I guess, was uh, not at all thinking that um, that magic would be sticking around a long time, and not even something that TSR should be thinking about. She constantly said, I mean, for the next year and a half, she constantly said they'll be dead in six months. <laughs> that's unbelievable. That's considering who's publishing Dungeons and Dragons now. That's a uh, that's some definite famous last words. Yes, isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? Well, actually, speaking of that, I did find a quote from you um, from way back then that uh, that basically says what you're saying. Um, this this issue of Scry Magazine in the, about the time you launched um, about the time you launched Spellfire, you had a quote here that said um, interesting, similar than what you've already said before. That a tiny company in 1974 of board gamers uh, created a thing called a role playing game, and all the hobby manufacturers of military simulations pointed their fingers and laughed at the silly idea. 20 years later, a company, uh, that company TSR stands at a multi-million dollar role-playing game industry. Then in 1994, tiny company of gamers created a thing called a collectible card game. And let me tell you, this is one dude who working for a large company wasn't going to point his finger and laugh. 
Yeah, really, exactly right. I knew it was going to be a big deal, and they got they just got better and better every single year. So that that's good too. They were able to adapt and change those rules. I mean, the first set of rules was a little booklet with eight point type that you could barely read, and it wasn't intuitive. It wasn't clear to go from step one to step two to step three, but that that changed quite soon after a, after about a year. The rules got lots better and lots easier to read. And, and they just did a good job of promoting themselves. And so our Spellfire came out and I wanted to do what they were doing. And, and, and we started out by, we had our rare cards, we had our ultra rare cards, we had our uncommon cards, just like what they were doing. Um, but we, I couldn't talk them into spending the money to do the tournament program that, that Wizards was doing with all of the stores. Right, right, the organized play organized playing so that you could win a contest and get some goodies you could get some rare cards if you played at the store it was a it was a brilliant marketing campaign just brilliant and i wanted to do the same thing she wouldn't she wouldn't let us spend the money wow well obviously the investment ended up paying off for magic the pro tour obviously went on to for another 20 years after that or so Yes, yes. It was just really good stuff. Really good stuff. But we did have something that Wizards of the Coast didn't have. <laughs> what was that? In the beginning, we came out with our set and it sold okay, but it didn't sell great. But I came up with a terrific idea. I, it, in Wizards of the Coast cards, it was hard to tell what a rare card was. You know, they didn't have them all marked up like they do these days. So I said, all of our rare cards should be photo cards because we had a we had a bunch of hams at, at, at uh, tsr you know they like to dress up in medieval costumes they had a lot of medieval um looking things like swords and lamps and things and so we started making all of our rare cards photo cards and we started that with the ravenloft set and we sold a ton because everybody knew what a rare card was and so they were easy to spot. And, and we, we continued that through all our sets. And, and we sold really well because the collectors loved knowing what the rare cards were by just looking at them. Well, that's so fascinating because being responsible for somebody who is uh, releasing the second ever CCG, you actually go through and, and do a lot of innovation like that. Like the photo cards, you know, yourself included on them, I've seen. Yes, I'm um, on 44 different cards. <laughs> Um, yeah, there was a lot of familiar faces amongst them, despite the fact that some of them have different names. But I loved it. It looked, it looked great. Um, and it became really a hallmark of Spellfire. But I just wanted to jump back prior to Spellfire coming out, because eventually your idea that you brought to Lorraine of making that game obviously did happen. Um, I wanted to just get an idea, like at the time, obviously, Gary might not have been as involved with TSR or anything like that. But do you remember him commenting on CCGs? No, no, he, he was gone from the company when that all started. Yeah, so I was just curious if, if he had any opinion of it or if he saw something familiar happening at, at Wizards of the Coast that would happen to him 20 years earlier. I, I never talked to him about collectible card games. We, we talked about lots of role-playing stuff. You know, I, I, I continue to say he really taught me how to, how to design and how to run games. So I, I, I credit Gary with all of that. Um, but we never talked about CCGs. Well, who better to have a teacher for anything than the creator of the entire thing? I know, I know. <laughs> I was very lucky. I was very lucky. That's fantastic. So, um, so okay, so word gets around at TSR. Let's like roll back to actually the making of Spellfire and see what you remember from it. So word gets around at TSR that, uh, that you guys are going to do a collectible card game, you know, champion by yourself. Um, is that... What are you are you hearing from TSR fans at that time that they want a, a Dungeons and Dragons uh, or you know like a TSR CCG? Absolutely not. Don't, didn't hear a word. No, no, no. Obviously, when it does make it to market eventually, it's it's popular, very popular amongst the group. It made it made TSR thirty million dollars in profit the first year. Thirty million bucks. I don't know TSR's books very well, but I'm sure that would be a lot compared to a lot of their products that they were making at the time. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It it sold great, and and the and the the booster packs that came out because again we're really lucky. We have a ton of art, and it's great art. So when we wanted to do the Ravenloft set, you know we did we did you always did 250 cards, and uh, and so we had a ton of Ravenloft art to use. 
which, which just made things much easier. And also it made things much profitable. We had already paid for this art, you know? So, so using it again, just was like, uh, you know, it was like sirloin steak. It was gigantically profitable. Yeah, yeah, you got both on the both sides of the the same coin. You got to use it once for the RPG books, and then it not only is it is it reusable art, but it's also gorgeous art regardless. That not everybody would have had the opportunity to see. Right, absolutely, you're right. Yeah, obviously the hardcore fans recognize it immediately, but somebody a little bit more casually involved with D and D might not have seen you know every piece of art from Ravenloft. You know, a hundred or so pieces, as you said. Um, so I guess my question then would be. You start designing Spellfire. I believe your team has people like Steve Winter on it, Zeb Cook and, and Tim Brown are all, you know, putting these efforts in you guys, something something you guys haven't done before. But obviously you're no stranger to jumping in the deep end and trying to design something you haven't done before, as you were saying with Metamorphosis Alpha before. Um, so uh, how did that process work? How, like, what was what was the like first meetings like? Do you remember anything about like what you guys wanted to do with it? Like... Sure, sure. No, well, we always wanted to put maps of the different game worlds in the card set. And maps kind of became the the basic thing you were trying to get a hold of in your deck of cards. Um, and because we had all these great color maps by Darlene on, on all the different worlds. I mean, we had tons of maps. And so that, that always was part of the plan. Um, the original set had a bunch of maps from every single world. And then the, the booster sets, you know, the Ravenloft set had a ton of Ravenloft maps and the al set had a ton of al maps. And they just, it, we just did, uh, um, that was the basic premise. And then we looked to have like, ki kind of like D&D characters, not exactly. We looked to have characters for the books that would fight and defend the lands. And, and so that's, that came up with our numbered characters. And then of course we had to have magic, magic items just like in D&D. &D. Um, so we wanted to kind of give not the same thing as Dungeons and Dragons, but we wanted to give very recognizable parts of D&D &D in the card set. And I think we succeeded in doing that for sure. Oh, definitely. Like those maps are so iconic, right? You said that. And the interesting thing I really liked about that is obviously Magic the Gathering has lands, but they really are just representative of you know, gold, they could have been gold and they could have been anything. They could have just been any resource. But those land, the, sorry, the um, the realm cards that you guys use were how you won the game. Yes, exactly. And I always found that so interesting and so innovative considering magic was all about, you know, uh, slaying your opponent or killing your opponent, getting their life points down. Whereas Spellfire was a little bit more optimistic. It was about building something up. <laughs> That's very true. I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah, yeah, it was a little, it was a little bit more uh, partisan. Obviously, you know, and only heroes would attack if somebody was coming on to evade their land and stuff like that. Narratively, I liked it. Yeah, narratively, I liked it a lot. Um, so I have heard, and I don't know if you'll have any memories of this, but I've heard that there was two versions of the Spellfire game when you guys were designing it. There was an original version that was what really wasn't working, and then you changed and pivoted to this more familiar model that you that we're talking about now. Do you have any memories of what that earlier type was it like? No, no, I don't think there was ever two versions. I mean, we we pl we play tested a bunch of different rules, and what what worked is good, and what didn't work is good. Um, but there wasn't really two different versions. Right, right. Well, that could have just been, you know, rumors or speculation or anything like that. Because I guess the game, because the game came out, I guess, in, in a rather, you know, quick time period. Obviously, you know, it was the first one to hit the market after Magic the Gathering. You guys did obviously an amazing job getting it out the door. I know. We, 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 we kind of broke ourselves when we made the game. Right. We, were, we were all working 60 hour, hour weeks just to just get the thing done. Wow. Was it just, do you remember if it was just a team of four of you working on it at the core of it? Cause. Well, no, and TSR never, <clears throat> TSR was always teamwork. So yeah, there were four designers, but then there were two or three editors. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually there was a Spellfire group of uh, five to six editors and designers that, that mm -hmm. made more versions of it. Um, so it, it was, it was, it was always really a, a good team play. I mean, we had, we had graphic artists and graphic experts that, that set up the cards and set up the look of the cards. They look amazing. Yeah. They, they do look very nice. Um, so, um, all of that, it was part of the TSR team and because we were really good at making products in those days. And, uh, you know, and I, and I'm pretty sure that Wizards of the Coast wanted to buy TSR to stop the, the selling of Spellfire because it was, it was, it kept growing. It never got smaller. It kept, 
getting larger and larger, which is very unusual for a game. Yeah, it definitely it definitely captured a lot of people's imagination. I, I I have seen historically that yeah, each set got more and more attention. Each base set that came out started selling out. Like you guys were having even trouble keeping up with it, from what I could tell at one point. That's very true. Yeah, so they they all sold great, um, and and it it was kind of a problem in that the, the, no matter what we printed after see after a while we we got a little bit cocky so. After we kept print, we kept printing more and more sets, and people kept buying more and more. But but towards the end, we printed too many. We it, it, we sold most of them, but we didn't sell all of them. That's amazing. So let's jump back to um to the origins of Spellfire. Um, do you you were saying you were play testing? It was all the play testing done for Spellfire in the TSR building? Absolutely, absolutely, yes, yes. We 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 play tested it every day that we were designing it. And what we, what we did was well, pretty much what uh, Wizards did with theirs. We uh, we had those card sleeves, and we we put blank cards in, and and you know they they dealt with the maps, and they dealt with the heroes, and they dealt with the spells and the special events. So uh, we we just started making um, written cards that turned into the cards that uh, became Spellfire. Um, so I was gonna ask. There's obviously a few other connections as well that. Um, make me curious about Spellfire. Um, obviously there is, you wanted to emulate a little bit of D&D. Um, D&D obviously famously used dice. Did you guys ever explore the idea of using dice in the Spellfire game? No, never ever. I, I, I saw that Wizards didn't and I didn't want to either. We talked a little bit about using cards for, uh, for, um, for the heroes, for instead of keeping track of their numbers in your head, we talked about doing cards that would keep track of their numbers, but but we rejected that as too clunky. Oh, right. Almost like character sheets. Yeah, yeah, almost like it. But we, we decided, you know, we wanted to keep this as streamlined as possible because the learning curve on magic was really big in the, in the beginning days. And we didn't want that learning curve. We wanted it to be even simpler. Right, right. Well, it's so interesting that you mention that because like I said, there is a bunch of, there is a bunch of things that being the second CCG that is, almost taken for granted now um, that you guys sort of came up with. Uh, things like you mentioned, like you being able to depict the rarity. Um, there's a collector number on every single card, which Magic wasn't doing either. Um, and do, was, do you remember talking about that and saying, hey, this is something we want to do to set us apart? Exactly right. We, we tried to do as many things as possible to set us apart from Magic the Gathering because we knew that we were gonna, when we came into the stores and our fans saw it, we'd be called the Me Too Company and we didn't like that idea at all. Of course. Well, I mean, you guys even famously didn't really have that tricky problem that, that Watsy had to balance where you guys didn't even opt to have like a resource, like a land or resource system. You guys were like, if you've got the cards, play them. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, and that was that seemed like a complete innovation. That's something that obviously no other collectible card game had done. And you mentioned before the photo cards, which were were photo cards in every single pack. There was one photo card in every single pack after after the first Spellfire release. We uh, we started with Ravenloft, and there was one in every single pack. Yep. Right, right. Because you guys also had like the rarer than rare, like the chase rare cards as well, right? But we, we had ultra rare cards too, and, and those were were one every six packs. That's amazing. Well, that's um that's probably the first time that's ever happened because Watsy at the time was doing just rare, common, uncommon, that sort of thing, and you guys sort of spearheaded what is now expected from the industry. They took them. We I should bring up that that Watsy was doing, um, for the retailer in, in the marketing set, they were doing cards that you could only get by playing the tournaments. Well, th th those were kind of ultra rare cards. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys did that too. I believe there was like a, there was one with the TSR logo on it at Gen Con and stuff. I, I talked, I talked the bosses into doing cards like that, telling them that Wizards, Wizards was getting all their fans because of things like that. And so I, I, I talked them into doing that. Well, they've become such legendary cards now, including I think the third promo card even has you on it. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I got that one. <laughs> show and tell i love it show and tell absolutely okay so uh let me see oh okay so are you holding up the uh tsr logo card that's the legendary artifact yes yes exactly and then here's me uh there we go promo number three what is it that's like weissmeister something i can't remember their name that is the uh now i gotta use my magnifying glass that is the 
the Ward Meister Strategy Special Event. All the yellow flags were special events. And look at that handsome devil. Who wouldn't be happy to uh, have that in their binder? Oh, really? And I got one more I got to <laughs> show you. I'm really yeah. proud of this if I can get the tape off to show you. Yeah. This is the it's good to be the king card. Like, yeah, yeah, I can't see it there, but I've seen it. That's fantastic. Oh, they're just, they were, they were fun cards to do. We just love doing them. Everybody loved dressing up. Um, all, all the people that were involved with, with the Spellfire game all dressed up as, as costume characters. Looking back now, they're so, um, I mean, they are kitschy, but they're so charming. I love every single one of them. <laughs> well good i'm glad thank you very much we we put a lot of thought into it and we and we we had a bunch of neat stuff so it was it was a good time that's great well do you have any other stories from like before spellfire came out anything else that like sort of comes to mind is anything that was that was tricky or or challenging or that you had to change at the last minute i had a great big disagreement with management i, I want I wanted to do something very different for Spellfire. So I called it the cantaloupe rule. And if you brought a cantaloupe to the tournament table, you got an extra card during the game. <laughs> See, I thought it was hilarious. I thought it would be fun. And, and my management hated that rule. Okay, let me just back up for a second because I think I know what you're talking about. In Australia, where I come from, they call them, I th do you mean like a melon? Yes, yes, a big, a big, big orange melon. Yes, <laughs> we call them rock melons, but yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. So if you brought that to and they, and they did it a ton. If you brought that to a tournament, you got an extra card during your tournament game. That's hilarious. It was just a fun thing to do that I know people would appreciate. My my management argued and argued and argued, and finally I just said, "We're doing it," and and put my foot down, and we did it, and people loved it. People loved it. That's hilarious. I would love to see a table full of cantaloupe photo. I should have taken pictures. I really should have. That's great. That's like a, it's almost like a potluck for every single tournament. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I did not know that. That is brilliant. I my life's mission now is to find a photo of a thousand cantaloupe or a hundred cantaloupes at a Spellfire tournament. Oh, that would be good. I hope I hope it happens. I don't remember seeing any pictures myself. Oh, well, I'll put it out there to the fans. Um, or if anybody has any memories, share them. So, um, so Spellfire launches basically like we were saying the whole time, just as the very next game after Magic, and it is a huge success. You know, you said thirty odd million dollars uh, of profit for, uh, well, not profit, but earnings for um, TSR, which was probably crazy money in those days. Do you have any memories of launching the game? I, I think it came out around the time Gen Con was on in nineteen ninety four. I have a naughty memory. You want to hear it? This is a uh, unrated podcast, uncut, director's cut. So John Danovich was was uh, in our in our sales force, and he wanted something. He wanted something to tell the retailers and the fans about Spellfire, and so we did this program where, if you sent us a deck of Magic the Gathering cards, we would send you two decks of Spellfire cards. <laughs> Sorry. So let me get this straight. So you could send in a, a single deck of any Magic the Gathering cards that existed and you would get in return an envelope two Spellfire decks? Yes, yes, exactly right. The, the mound of, of Magic cards that we got was like four feet high. <laughs> it was, just, and, and plus we were all Magic players at the time. So we got tons, we got tons of fun cards out of the deal. And because, uh, you know, my management didn't care about Magic cards. But, but the people who played Magic, every day we'd dive into the pile and pick out cards that we wanted. Well, you wouldn't be worried about not having any, um, any red monsters now anymore. You, you'd have everything you wanted. Oh, I know, I know. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, yeah. I put together a really cool goblin deck that I was very proud of and won a couple, couple tournaments with. Wow, I didn't realize you played tournaments. Oh, yeah, I played tons of tournaments. I enjoyed the tournament program. And, you know, I like, I like the competition a lot. Um, so, I mean, those cards, thinking about that nowadays, those cards being early Magic cards would probably be worth maybe even millions, that collective pile. Silly dollars. I mean, when, when, Silly a, dollars. Black, when a Black Lotus is worth $40,000, give me a break. 
That's yeah, that is uh that is an unusual when you're looking at magazines like these and they say a black lotus is $25 or $50 or something like that in the early days. To think about that nowadays, that's a huge return on investment. Uh, eBay eBay just goes wild with the cards, yeah. So, uh you told me about the photo cards. Um did you have a in particular favorite Spellfire card from either the photo cards or one that you just like to play? Ooh, that's a that's a great question. I, I really like playing Greyhawk cards and using the Greyhawk heroes and the Greyhawk items. I, I enjoyed that tremendously. So what, what I was going to ask is Spellfire also, much like Magic was at the time, I think it even might have beaten Magic, but eventually gets international versions. I think there was a German version. and Oh, yeah, right. Well, TSR was always great about licensing stuff. And, uh, and right away, we got called from, from Germany and Japan. They wanted to do the cards. And, and we, you know, we, we said, uh, just start pitching us checks and you could do the cards. And, and so that's what they did. And, you know, and today, these days in the Spellfire sales market, all of the, the, the foreign cards, you know, sell the best. The Japanese cards, you know, everybody can recognize a Japanese Spellfire card for the picture that's on it. And so they know what the power is, but, but it's in Japanese or it's in German. Or it's an Italian and, and people just love buying those and putting them in their decks. That's amazing. Well, they say that money makes the world go around, but obviously money makes Spellfire go around the world. Oh, it, it turned out to be a great license for an unexpectedly good license for us. So did you get to travel to any of those places and promote that game when they launched in those territories? Absolutely. I went to I went to uh, it's the Essen Game Fair in the fall. I'm in Germany. It's the biggest game fair in the world. It's like four different football fields full of games. Yeah, my live stream is to visit Essen one day, but it's amazing you have to go and play Spellfire. Yeah, you have to do it. It's just, it's tremendous. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the food is just wonderful beyond belief. And the gamers mm -hmm. are so very enthusiastic. So all the, all the game companies in, in Germany and many from other different companies come and what they do is they set up a booth and they set up 10 to 20 tables in front of their booth. And everybody expected to come and play the games right there at the, at the show. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did with Spellfire. We ran a bunch of tournaments for several years where we sold a game um, and, and the Germans are crazy players. You know, I like a 60 card deck because you can get pretty much everything out in a 60 card mm -hmm. deck. The Germans like 200 card decks. <laughs> <laughs> they love they love as many cards as possible in their decks which it just it just amazed me they they don't play to win they just play to play i think that is a good way from what i've heard about european gaming it's 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 an event it's not a competition it's a it's an event to be enjoyed yeah you know and that's very true especially in germany you know everybody on the weekends they, they play family board games you know that that's a very gaming town and uh and and i was always impressed by that so we're going to jump back to Spellfire. I, I had read originally that, um, I, I don't know whether it was through a press release or an interview or something like that, that Spellfire was originally pitched in a limited capacity for only two years of product. Do you have any memory of that? I'm, I'm not understanding the question. So um, I've read that initially um, TSR had only planned to support Spellfire for two years, but obviously it was more... Absolutely not. No, no, not true. We, we planned on doing four, we, we set up uh, four expansions a year. And then every, every year, every other year, we planned on redoing the basic set. So it, we, we had plans for years and years. That's great. Well, I remember before, like when there was sets announced when Wizards of the Coast announced that they had bought TSR and unfortunately didn't support the game. Like you said, it may have been because they didn't want a secondary fantasy game in the market. We, we were we were taking a lot of their market share and they didn't like it yeah yeah now at the same time you guys were doing uh spellfire there was another game that tsr released that was a collectible card game blood wars that was for planescape do you have any memory of that yeah absolutely that i didn't help with the design of that but but we wanted another success like spellfire and so we did the same things we had rare cards and and uncommon cards and and we, we did the, the, uh, the artwork from Planescape. We had lots and lots of great Dieter Lietze art. And, uh, and, we, and we put that together and, and it sold very well. It didn't sell as good as Spellfire, but it sold very well. Right, right. It was, um, it was very interesting graphic design. I think it was fantastic. 
Um, was there a reason that you guys you guys wanted a, a whole separate game for Planescape? You didn't want to do a like a Planescape version of Spellfire? Yeah, no, I know what you mean, but again, it, it's the, it's the fishing analogy. We 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 wanted to put out different baits for different people. So you know, we that, that's why we did Ra the Ravenloft expansion was for the horror fans, and the and the Al Qadim expansion was for the Arabian Nights fans. And so the, the Planescape set of cards was was for people who loved Planescape, the role playing game, and and when we hope to get another another batch of fans that weren't playing Spellfire or Magic. Yeah, yeah, no, I get, I get it, definitely. Product diversity is always key to a successful business. Yes, exactly. So I guess um, the other thing I'd heard about that I wasn't really sure about. Obviously, there was a few canceled sets when Wizards of the Coast um, re uh, bought TSR. But there was also a, a planned, I don't know if you'll have any memory of it, but a planned spell jammer set. Do you know anything about that? Well, yeah, I, I was in on, on that set. I mean, we wanted to do something from every one of our campaign worlds. So spell jammer was just, the nice thing about spell jammer was it was connected to all our other worlds. You could spell jam from, from the dark sun to the forgotten realms to, to Ravenloft. You could spell jam to all those worlds. And so we, we, we thought it was going to be a big deal, but again, you know, those witches boys didn't want to do it. And I know they've had several offers for people who wanted to buy Spellfire, but they've always said no. Really? Wow. Okay. Um, well, I hope with, I guess they're bringing back, you know, like you said, magic into uh, Dungeons and Dragons into their magic world. So, I mean, I hope it's some way the legacy is, is, is surviving through that somehow. <laughs> I don't think so, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Am I too much of an optimist? Am I too glass half full? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely not happening as long as Wizards owns the trademark. Right, okay. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit? Um, Wizards obviously buys TSR in 1997, but you're not there at that time, are you? Right, no, I left. She, Lorraine wanted to do some ugly stuff with our uh, people. Oh, go on. She, she asked me to fire 20 editors and designers. And that was that was to make our bottom line look better, and I refused. I said these people are the are the people who lay the golden eggs, so how can, how can you even think about firing them? And I said we have we have accountants. I, I said the different departments who weren't bringing in money, who weren't making TSR you know a profit, and I said you can't do this to people because they they're the ones who bring the golden eggs. And for six months. I tried to talk her out of it and I couldn't talk her out of it. So I said, that's it. I, I quit because I didn't want to fire my friends. Wow, that's very noble. Well, I don't know about that. But... Well, I mean, you've been with the company for over two decades at least. Yeah, yeah. I love TSR just passionately, but but Lorraine turned it into something that I didn't love anymore. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, guess that's, as they, as the people who try and justify that sort of crap, that's business, as they say. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, she sold, she, she bought in for $3 million and sold it for $30 million. So as a business effort, that was a perfect idea for her. But I, I didn't like what happened. No, no, I wouldn't. I, don't, I honestly don't like the legacy left the way it was either. Um, so you end up going on, obviously taking your experience from Spellfire and working on other collectible games. Um, you end up, I think your next stop on that journey is at Precedence Entertainment. Do you have any memories of working there? Precedence. Oh, pre pre sorry, Precedence. Sorry, I'm at, <laughs> I can't blame my accent for that one. That's all right. No, that was a fun job. I, I worked there about a year and a half, almost two years. And I got to work on lots of things. The Babylon 5 card game I helped with, the, the uh, Tomb Raider card game, the Wheel of Time card game. I helped on all of those, all of those products. And it was very enjoyable to work with those guys. They knew what they were talking about when, when it came to collectible card games. And, uh, and they just needed a little help getting stuff done. And so that's, that's kind of what I did. I, I kind of was, was the, the, the man of all trades. So they, when they needed artwork done, I got a bunch of artists to do their Wheel of Time artwork. And when, when they need the, the, the Babylon 5 cards um, play tested, for uh, for you know if they break the game or not, I play tested the Babylon Five games, and I, I helped with the the initial design for for the Tomb Raider game. So I, I did kind of a little bit of everything with those guys. That's amazing. So um, for somebody who I mean, I guess you probably didn't have all those angles of experience in collectible card games with Spellfire. You sort of designed it and helped shepherd the product. Yeah. Yeah. Do so. 
learning all those things, you obviously get to go on and make your own collectible card game at one point or design another one. Um, but before you leave, um, do before you leave them, did you have a favorite of those games that you worked on or a favorite moment? Ooh, that's that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I uh, the only thing I didn't like was Wheel of Time. Right? Why is that? They, they made me read all the books, and I did not like the storyline <laughs> at all. I mean, I thought it was ridiculous, but uh, but very popular books in their day, and uh, and and working with the artwork, working with the artists was all like trying to herd cats. You know, they, they, they weren't good with deadlines. They weren't good. With, we gave them very specific art orders. They weren't good with art orders. I, I made them against their will do sketches of each piece of art and send that for approval. And they hated doing that. Um, and so it, it was it was a labor, a, a big task to get the artwork done for that game. Um, and then Babylon 5, I, I watched all of those episodes. I loved it. It was, it was the, the TV show. I just, I just very enjoyed. I um, mean, working, on, working, uh, it was a very good show. I'm working on those cards was fun. And then uh, Tomb Raider, Tomb Raider had lots of fun possibilities. Um, and, and so we did, we did a lot of play testing of that. So it, it turned out really well, but they, they weren't very, how shall I say this nicely? They, they weren't business people at precedence. They, they spent their money on weird things and, and they didn't put it back into the program. You know, they didn't have a decent, they didn't have a decent marketing plan and they didn't, they didn't have a decent retailer plan. So uh, it, it wound up that they sold a lot of cards, but they didn't make a lot of profit. Right, right. Well, I mean, those are some fun games. Unfortunately, they didn't become the juggernauts that, you know, things like Spellfire and Magic did, but there is definitely some fun games there. And I know each of those games has their own definite dedicated fan base, especially Babylon 5. Yep, exactly right. Yeah, yeah, especially being because it's because it has that multiplayer element and it was tied into the show. Did you have a favorite deck to play in Babylon Five? No, no, I didn't. I didn't do a lot of playing of the game. I just worked on the cards. Right, right. Well, you've taken all this experience of like you know you've worked on Spellfire, you've worked on three separate games there, um, and you actually I think the next stop is you get hired to make another collectible card game. This one based on uh, this brand new, uh, super exciting Japanese property, Dragon Ball Z. Do you remember how that that agreement that arrangement came about oh well yes i do it was kind of a strange story so so i'm freelancing and doing work for lots of different companies and uh and uh i have a couple good friends in the industry and the the dunrus people are calling around finding out who should they should get to design um the dragon ball z license that they just picked up and so a bunch of my friends said, you got to have James Ward do the design because he has the most experience in designing card games of anybody in the industry. So they, they gave me a call and, and we started talking about things and, and how I would do things. And, uh, and they gave me a nice salary to design it. I couldn't talk them into a royalty, which would have been too bad because, again, they made $25 million on the first release of dragon ball z right it was a big it was a big a big big property yeah huge huge hit because it was on tv every single day so you know a bunch of bunch of the kids and 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 uh, teens were watching the show and so there was a lot of pull there funimation did the, the dragon ball z cartoon in america yeah do you so were you familiar with it before you took the job dragon ball z that is i see I'd seen a couple of them, but I, I hadn't. They made me watch all 407 episodes. <laughs> That's worth a salary in itself. Oh, man. It was just a ton of work. Um, and so what, what I had to do, they gave me videotapes. And so um, all, the, all the frames in the cartoon were numbered, 1 to 500. And so I would watch the show. And when I saw a picture that I wanted, I would stop it and write down the number. Okay? And, and then I was able to design the, the game using the cards because I knew the exact image that they were going to do. So the main characters, you know, Vegeta and, and, uh, and Goku and those boys, I knew the exact picture that I was going to use to make them from watching the shows. That's fantastic. It was, it was pretty neat to, the way that worked. And so they, what they would do is they would give us a special, um, I think it was 400 DPI dots per inch Maybe it was 600, but I think it was 400 DPI dots per inch um, picture of, of what I asked for, the frame that I asked for. And then it was easy to turn that into a card. 
Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so the first the first set was about two hundred and thirty cards, and again we did the thing we did the same thing that Wizards was doing. We had rare cards, common cards, uncommon cards. We had special ultra rare cards. Um, I made the I made them set up a club right away, and then I made them set up a uh, 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 a fan base where you could call into the company and ask a question about the game and get it answered. What, like a hotline, like Wizards was doing. Just like a hotline, yes. And that worked very, very well. And then we started going around the United States and, and they had a great idea. They bought a Humvee and they painted, they painted it with all the Dragon Ball Z logos and pictures. And that Humvee would go from store to store to store running a tournament for the store. That would be amazing. That thing went all across the United States, going from each state, doing three or four hobby stores in each state. And it was a program that, that worked great. It really got the word out about the game. Well, if you were a kid and you saw that driving into town, I would be straight down buying those booster packs. I know, I know. I'm still the same about the Oscar Mayer Wiener car that comes down the town. I'm right down there wanting to get a whistle as soon as I can. Exactly, exactly. There you go. Age old tested marketing. That's great. So the game, the game did very well. I worked on the first five sets. Um, and then, then unfortunately for them, they hired a Wizards of the Coast guy. And, and he didn't like me at all. Because what would happen is uh, the, the, the management over at Dunruss would say, well, we would like this set in three months. And the Wizards of the Coast guy said, we can't possibly do it in three months. We'll need at least six months. And then they'd come and ask me. And I said, I can easily get it done in three months. <laughs> so pretty much everything he said, I would contradict. And he didn't like he didn't like the competition. So I, I got left aside and that's fine. But it's kind of funny because the sets that came out after that, just riddled with errors and questions. And they were really hard to play until finally um, the, the Dragon Ball Z people bought the license back. Right, right. Yeah, there was some later versions of your, actually your design. So speaking of your design, how did you actually approach, you know, this, you, know you're, you said you were vaguely familiar with the property, but you sat down and you watched, you know, the 400 plus episodes that can be very slow. Having done it myself, I understand that it's a very slow process to get through some of those scenes. I did two a day until I was all done. <laughs> oh, that's still 200 days of work. That's some intensity. Um, I was going to ask, how do you approach a design like that? Obviously, you know, you'd done design for Spellfire. You'd helped a little bit with Tomb Raider. And Dragon Ball is a, such a unique game. How did you approach that design? Well, uh, okay. I, I really based everything on the show and what they were doing on the show. So on the show... Um, some of the players had this really weird uh, monocle and they would, they would look at a character through the monocle and the monocle would tell them how strong they were based on thousands of points. So when you looked at the beginning Goku, he was like a 7,000 point um, fighter. Perfect for a game. Yes, yes, exactly. And so, and so each one of these characters had a, a point total and I built that into the game so that um, the, the character evolved. You could have four different versions of the character and he had more and more, more points and he did more and more damage based on his point total. And then I know it was fun. And then I gave them an idea for a little slide rule, um, kind of a, it was a sword that, uh, that was made out of paper and it would, it would have a slide rule of one to five. And so you, you, everybody started with five hit points. And as you took damage, you'd go down one until you got to zero. And then you, then you were done and you lost the game. Those guys, they had a really smart um, art director in those days. And those guys turned that into a plastic sword. And the sword, the sword sheath was the slide rule. <laughs> I remember that. That was fantastic. Oh, it was just, it was really fantastic. It was a great idea because it was, it was a visual element. And when, when you're at conventions and you see these kids playing with these swords, you know, you're, you're kind of drawn to it, wondering what they're doing. And so it just worked tremendously. I was just so happy with what they did with this plastic sword. It was, it was just great fun. Well, I definitely saw at the time, and I, like I said, I played those early games, and, and there was the sword, and then it was the little, almost the monocle itself on the big Z that would go up and down the card to indicate the power level. I definitely saw some more 
more cynical critics call the sword a coffee stirrer, but that's B, that's that's BS. Let's not let's not get into that because you're right. It is a visual board state thing that made the game look and present so impressively. It really did, and you know what? There are people who who hate the fact that their ice cream is cold. <laughs> I bet you they hate cantaloupes too. I bet they do. I bet they do. Now there, there's always critiques, and I've got I got my share of people that just hate my stuff without even reading it. <laughs> so that's just that's just life but uh but yeah it, it was a great element i think it, it did very well for them that's fantastic so i do want to ask because the design has three i'd never seen it before as a kid obviously it had only been done in a handful of games but had three ways to win they had the the fighting way like where you'd punch each other you'd have a a victory where you could collect the dragon balls again like you said just like in the show and then a victory where you would get the highest power level or whatever it is like was that baked in from the beginning like was that something that you thought that was off of the show so i i try to do as many things off the show and the dragon balls of course are my favorite thing seven dragon balls that each have a massive power oh my goodness they were so much fun to design and and so and they were rare cards so everybody wanted them so the effort to collect the dragon balls was like the biggest collectible effort in any card game ever because everybody wanted the seven in their deck that's amazing that is fantastic i vaguely do remember that indeed and like i said just seeing i played a couple of collectible card games at the time i was quite young but having a game where you had the option to win the way you wanted to win was so empowering almost as much as building a deck you could build a deck to win the way you want to exactly right you and that that was done on purpose um, it, 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 having choices is always good in any game. And the more choices you can give them, um, still making the game clear, the better the, des the design. So yeah, that was, and again, all of those choices were based on the show. I tried to bring in as much of that as I could. Funimation loved me. They loved what I was doing and how I was doing it. Interesting story. Okay, so we did our, we did our 250 cards and we wanted Japan to approve them because Funimation couldn't approve the, the card design that it had to be done in Japan by the, the makers of Dragon Ball Z. And so they sent the 250 cards to them and and said, we would like this in a couple of weeks. And that irritated the Dragon Ball Z company no end. And they wrote back and said, we will we will approve one card a month. <laughs> 200, 250 cards, one. And they were they were serious. They were deadly serious. So I get a I get a call from Dunruss saying, "Jim, uh, you have to fly to Japan." What? What are you talking about? And they they said you have to fly to Japan and you have to talk to these people and make them realize that we need approvals on these cards right away because we want to sell them in three months. And so did you go and bridge that gap between east and west? I flew to Japan. I, I discovered that they really liked old people, so they really liked me. We went over the cards, and I praised. I pray. I just laid it on really thick. I praised them to the skies about Dragon Ball Z and how innovative it was, and how much of a pleasure it was to work on. I mean, I laid it on. I laid it on with a trowel. That's how thick it was. The BS that I laid out, and and they loved it. And I got them to approve all 250 cards that day wow so i was just so very proud of myself and they showed me a couple other um fun cartoon things that they were doing and again I, I praised them to the skies oh how innovative this is and oh how marvelous it'll do in america and i did i didn't know if it would do any good in america but i said it just to please them right do you remember anything that they showed you oh no i don't remember any of the anime they showed me i don't think any of it right. got, got to america right right so uh, we got the we got the 250 approved and then from then on when we had sets to approve i would write them a long letter saying you know this is what we're trying to do with this design and and it and they they loved the letters they just they liked it we always got quick approvals from then on wow that's uh that's amazing so the graphic design of the card itself was not done in japan that was done at uh or score or done russ as you said that was done 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 with and score yeah that, that was the same company and they, they did a great job. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, currently I'm selling a bunch of the D Dragon Ball Z cards, and a bunch of the characters going for like three hundred dollars a piece. It's a, uh, it's, it's you have decided the right time to get into the market. All those old card games since 
since we've gone into lockdown, have just skyrocketed. Yeah, they really have. Um, I wanted to ask about Dragon Ball Z. There is a little interesting thing I just sort of... I sort of noticed when I was doing research for this episode that it hadn't really clicked with me before, despite the fact that I had played Dragon Ball Z when I was a kid. Um, there, one of the ways that you determined your damage was through a chart, like a physical attack chart. You know, if you have this, if one character has this much power and the other character is the defender and has this much power, you check the chart to see how many cards of damage you do, did. Um, that was one of the ways that you built into the game combat. Um, and it sort of struck me when I was doing research for this that that's, Interesting. Do you think that that chart element was inspired by your years of role-playing game design, which is obviously always checking charts? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, we did a couple of really fun charts. In uh, We did a Marvel chart for Marvel, the role-playing game, and, and we, did, uh, we did a couple of other charts in other of our role-playing games. And they were really popular and everybody liked them. So th uh, that's definitely an influence of mine to put that one together. Yeah, it was just something that struck me that it, because I don't think a designer would have approached it that same way, but it's such a unique thing in all of collectible card games that you have this ever growing, ever changing chart that you can always compare your characters to. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely um, it's definitely so interesting. So um, do you have any other memories of, of really great Dragon Ball Z uh, moments that you had with that game? Obviously, you went to Japan, but with players or at tournaments or because you said you get them to set up a fan club and stuff. You know what was fun? Um, going to conventions were fun. The Dragon Ball Z actors that did the voices, they loved coming to conventions. And so they, well, they, they would, um, Dunruss would invite them over. They, they'd pay for their hotel rooms. And those guys were just a hoot to talk to and deal with. And and the fun part about it was that during the convention, you'd hear them break into the voices of the characters. So so the Krillin actor would do the Krillin voice, and the Goku actor would do the Goku voice. And it was just it was just fun being around them, and uh, it was it was very enjoyable. That's hilarious. Now, do you remember any other? Um, obviously, you mentioned you clashed with some personalities from uh, from. Uh, that had got brought in from other companies. Um, do you remember any other biggest challenges when either when designing Dragon Ball Z or when trying to get it to market? Like anything else that was really a hard sticking point for you? You know, I don't think so. We, it, the design was pretty easy for me because I'd been doing it a lot. And, uh, and, I, and again, I had the whole, all the shows to, to take elements from, which made it really nice. Um, and so the design was pretty easy. Um, I'm trying to think. And, and then they, they wanted to, set up success they wanted to be a success and so getting them to set up a club and getting them to set up a a, a phone format that was easy to do they wanted to do that um because you know that's what the competition was doing and they they were very competitive people in general and so and so that that all was pretty easy to do and then of course we, we got them to do the 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 store the store games and the and the cards for the store games so that was pretty easy to do um and, and they already understood foil cards so they they were doing foil things that i had never even dreamed of doing oh yeah high tech cards and stuff yes yes that turned out terrific they did a lenticular card they did a foil bunches of foil cards of the main characters and and everybody and their mother wanted those they're still highly they're still highly collectible well, they were on thick cardboard, not like just a regular card stock, but like, you know, half an inch thick. Well, not half an inch, but like half a centimeter thick that were so impressive. Again, adding to that board state when you walk past at a game store and people are playing flat 2D games of Magic the Gathering, you'd walk past Dragon Ball Z and all of a sudden it was a 3D game. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, it, it was fun stuff. So, I mean, I guess after that, you eventually, what leaves you, uh, what brings you to leaving the property? Oh, well the the magic the gathering guy kicked me out oh right okay he didn't he didn't like having he didn't like having to talk to his bosses and have me contradict him right right i'm sorry to hear that yeah well that's just life so and it happened it happened right at 9 11 so i i wasn't eager to get back on planes during during that very bad time so it was all right i i, I survived fine and and went on to other things. Right. Well, before you left, you know, Don Russell scored. Did you have anything to do with the Buffy game that they released? See, that's another kind of sticky point. I, I was all set to go in there and start designing it. But but the Magic the Gathering guy had had his two cronies that he was working with. And they weren't interested in my design input. 
I play tested it. I told them the stuff that I thought was wrong with it. And they changed some things, but they didn't change other things. And it wasn't, you know, that big of a hit. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It definitely was one that did not sort of have the longevity that their Dragon Ball game had. Right. And you mentioned before that it had been, that that game that essentially was based on your design had been brought back a couple of times. You know, Panini America brought it back um, and it had been brought back as a Dragon Ball GT, I think it's called, the, the next sort of Dragon Ball saga. Did you get contacted when they were doing anything like that? No, no, I didn't get asked to do any of that. That's that's all right. That's it. Well, I mean, yeah, that's all right. But I mean, your legacy is still in the DNA of that game and that property. And it's kind of nice, isn't it? It's fantastic. What a legacy to have. So you go off and sort of at this point, the Wizards of the Coast has bought TSR. And in an irony, they've released third edition Dungeons and Dragons, which brought with it D20, which was basically, uh, you know, the free availability for any RPG company to make a game based on their system. And you start a company uh, for D20 as well called Fast Forward Entertainment. Do you want to tell me about that? Well, we, we started our own little company. I mean, I, I always thought it was a terrible mistake that Wizards let people do um, D&D modules based on the D&D license. I, I just thought it was a big mistake. And, uh, and so, but we, we capitalized on it and did very well for a while. For three years, we, we sold very well. But, but after a while, the mark, that market dropped out and we, we didn't get the sales we needed. Right. Well, in amongst working for there, there was a opportunity i guess you guys got the license for a bit and there was a lot of talk that you guys were going to do another ccg with the cross gen license there do you have any memories of working on that or how that deal came about and, and what eventually happened we we love the cross gen comic books we all we all read them and so we said you know i, I told the, my my people why don't we call these guys see if they're interested in doing a collectible card game and we did, and they were very interested, and they gave us wonderful terms. They really did, um, and and their comics were just perfect for for doing collectible card game cards. We had we had it all designed. It was it was a finished, ready to go deal, and then that company went belly up. Right, the fast forward. You mean, or do you mean N no, the cross gen company? So we weren't we weren't able to release our game. Wow! So you guys got all the way through like designing cards and putting images to them and everything like that, and play testing and everything. It was it was ready for sale. Wow! I mean, I, it's one of those things that if only things had happened differently, or if the market had hit a different, you know, if that problems had hit a following year, you could have had a, a huge successful CCG on your hand. That would have been great. Yes, it was a fun design. We I think you know that was another good deal we did, but it just didn't happen. It's just life. Well, because there's almost no other way to find out about it. Um, do you want to tell me about what that design was? I, were you the lead designer on it? I was the lead designer, but I'd rather not talk about it because maybe someday I will do a different version that looks just like it. <laughs> well, if you do, give me a call and I would love to tell people about it. If it's a card game or if it's a collectible card game, I would love to... Um, I would love to champion that product if it comes out in some other form. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I would love to do another CCG, but but again, I, I can't do them on spec. I got to got to be paid for the work. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of work involved with them. There really sure. is. Yes, you can't you can't do a good, good job in three months. You need you need six or seven just to do the design work. And then there's playtesting. There's playtesting and the balance. Yeah, of course, the balancing and then, you know, everything, getting it printed, everything like that. So that sort of brings us, as far as I know, to the end of your CCG tenure, we'll say. We'll call you Professor CCG. Was there, um, was, was there any other memories that you wanted to share from your, like, other games you might have touched over the years or anything like that? No. <laughs> well, we hit quite a few, that's for sure. We did, we did. Such, like I said, a legacy, both Dragon Ball and TSR's uh, d d property. The um, other thing I wanted to ask is, as you said, there was, at the time of it getting shut down by WotC, there was a ton of passionate fans for Spellfire. Yes, there, there still is, actually. I, I had a couple full sheets of Spellfire cards, and a guy in Germany paid real big bucks to buy them. Wow. Germany still has a big... Big Spellfire following. That's amazing. They're beautiful cards as well, as we talked about before and everything. Um, do you, uh, like you said, you're well aware that there are still people who are engaged in it. And there was even rescue efforts that Wizards of the Coast looked the other way on when the game was coming out. Like people sold booster packs with stickers that you could sticker your old cards over and play those sort of things. Do you have any memories or did you ever interact with the community after you stopped working on it? No, no, I didn't. No, that's a shame. Obviously they still, I think they still do a tournament at at Gen Con every year as you know that's where the the worlds and stuff like that have always been held so um if you're ever around poke, poke your head in and just see how they're going 
I don't usually go to Gen Con anymore. Oh no, really? Why not? No, I, I, I don't. I'm not pleased with the management of it. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, obviously, it was such a uh, you know a big place for TSR employees like that. So I can understand that you know if things that have changed more recently are uh, you know not as familiar as they once were. I can understand why that might not be the most enjoyable place to be. Correct. Yeah. So um, the other thing I wanted to touch on, just because my audience is obviously um, card game players, um, you actually, you have a product from a couple of years ago that was uh, an RPG product, but it heavily involved cards. Do you have any um, anything to say about that? I think it was 77 Worlds. Oh, 77 Lost Worlds. Yeah, it, it it's, oh, that, this, is, this is an interesting story. Do you have about three hours? <laughs> I have as long as you want. So let's dive into it. Yes. A man named Stephen Lee, a genius down in Florida, um, came up with the 77 Lost Worlds idea. And the concept is just brilliant beyond brilliant. So here's what happens. Man goes out to the stars. He settles on 70, 76 different worlds. Right. Right. What do you think happened to the 76 worlds out there? And so your basic effort is to try to get out into space and get to those worlds and find out what happened to them. Right. And so I did the basic set and I didn't want to do dice because everybody does dice. I, I try very hard on my designs to do stuff that hasn't been done before. So this is why it would appeal to card game players. I'm going to teach you how to play this game in about 10 seconds. Okay, I'm ready. Red cards are good. Black cards are bad. When you want to hit something, you must draw a heart to hit it. When you want to pr be protected from something, you must draw a spade to be protected. You now know how to play the game. Okay, so just, just because we missed a step, I want to tell all the audience that you don't use dice, you use a regular size playing card deck. So what Jim is saying there is you shuffle up the deck and then when you draw, like Jim was saying, you know, if you draw a heart, you get that effect. If you draw a spade, you get that effect. It's 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 like a D20, but in a deck. So if you're a card game lover, yes, you know, maybe check out 77 Lost Worlds if you like the card game feel but want to try RPGs. Yeah, that's that you can get that on it has its own Facebook page, and you can get that on firesidecreations.com. Please do a link to it for me. I will absolutely put a link in the description to Fireside. Oh, that's wonderful. So anyway, I do want to move on to our next segment, which is community questions. I ask you questions that I have requested from the community. And if there's anything of the games that you've worked on that they want to ask about, um, I'm going to ask you, are you okay with that? Okay, let me, let me hit, just press one more little button. All right. So, so on, uh, I, I work with uh, Goodman Games to, to sell um, Metamorphosis Alpha um, products, modules, the Metamorphosis Alpha book. I work with them on that. And they do a land office business in their game store. And then I work with Troll Lord Games. And, and they have come out this month with the latest Metamorphosis Alpha product. It's called The Warden. It's a 680 page book. It's, it's filled with maps and filled with all the monsters from Metamorphosis Alpha and all of the technical items from Metamorphosis Alpha. And it, it's really kind of my opus to science fiction. Basically, you can play any science fiction game with it, but it's it's made for playing with Metamorphosis Alpha. And then the Troll Lord has a science fiction version called Siege Engine, and it's made for that. And that's coming out this month. So you can go to trolllords.com and order this marvelous 680 page book. It costs 80 bucks, but I think it's well worth it. Well, like I said, um, I, it's something actually I wanted to ask you about a little bit later in the episode, but I'm glad you brought it up now because it's something that I'm so interested in. As like we said in the intro, you are, and we've just heard why, you are the father of sci-fi RPGs. And this is the ultimate tribute to that legacy. So check out The Warden out very shortly. I'll put a link in the description. And also check out 77 Lost Worlds and even The Dragon Scales. I'll put all links in those in the description. That's wonderful. I, I appreciate that. So now we have a bunch of questions from interested viewers of your uh, of your of the show. 
That's absolutely correct. So uh, there's a few things I want to check in on. There's um, actually some that have already been answered. So I just want to say uh, thank you to Sam L who asked about Magic releasing a draw midge uh, character card from their, uh, well, we just covered that in the early episode. So we'll we'll, we'll uh, refer to that, but that would be very exciting. I would, if that ever happens, I would love for you to send you a card to sign for me. Oh, I would happily do that. If you'd send me two so I get to keep one. <laughs> and anybody else who wants one signed as well if that ever happens in the future who knows where that goes with uh, wizards of the coast so i also want to thank mike grinless for asking about the production of spellfire and blood wars we did cover that earlier in the episode and we will refer to the early parts of the episode there um so is there any other game uh this is a question by anthony dulac is there any other game that Spellfire was inspired by other than Magic the Gathering and D&D? Well, you know, there wasn't any other card games out there to be inspired by. Um, so, no, I, I think mainly the inspiration is it was D&D and AD&D. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, well, obviously we talked before about how Realms was such a big element. It's something that you really wanted to incorporate into the game itself. And there was champions that sort of replicated the heroes that you were. And we almost got like a character sheet type card as well. Um, it's been fantastic history to cover. So I do have another big fan from the uh, CC, the dead CCG collectors group, who's a, who's a big fan of, of CCGs. And he just wants to ask a general CCG question. So from your perspective, as somebody who's, who's designed many CCGs, do you have a preference with dealing with cards that end up having to be overpowered? Do you prefer to ban them or do you prefer to update them with some sort of errata to their rules? Do you have a preference for this? You know, uh, first of all, I hate ban cards with a, with a passion because I, I think, you know, you're, you're spending good money to buy a card and then they won't let you play it in a tournament. I, I do not like that at all. I think, I, I mean, and, and I, I had, Spellfire had a couple cards that were too strong. Um, we didn't get enough play testing in on it. Caravan. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, buddy. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> had to drop that one. <laughs> and yeah, I, I agree. I agree. But I think good game design makes that happen as little as possible. I just, I just don't like them. I don't like banned cards. Yeah, if you had to deal with one, then you would prefer to update the rules to it. Well, I, I prefer not to have it at all. <laughs> okay, well, we'll... Is, is that silly of me? <laughs> no, no, no. You know what? I think that's the dream of every collectible card game designer, that it doesn't happen at all. But even Wizards has its Black Lotuses. Oh, my goodness. Poor Wizards. They just they have way too many bad cards. I mean, I, I played in a couple of tournaments where, where the kid got out three cards and I was done. <laughs> I, I didn't much like that. <laughs> no, no. That's uh. Th this is. I know you probably haven't kept up with it, but it's more of a problem now-ish than it ever has been before. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um. So, uh, my next question comes from. Well, this is not really a question. He did. Uh, he did prompt me to ask this. He said that he'd read that you'd worked or at least helped play test uh, Margaret Weiss's, um and Dom Perrin's uh, Star of the Guardian CCG. Do you have any memory of that? Mm, I didn't help play test it at all. They, they designed that without me. They did, they did put me in as a card in, in the set. Oh, really? Tell me about that. They made me an evil character. <laughs> 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 and, the, and the card did horrible things to a player's hand. Um, wow. But they thought it was amusing that I was in the, in the set. Now, do you mean when you're in the set, are you the art or do they do an homage to your name? Both. Oh, okay. I'll have to look out for that. If anybody's watching and is interested, I'll make sure I link that card if I can find it below. I, I would be amazed if you could still find it. That's, that thing hasn't been around forever. I'll have a look and have a look at the, the database of cards I have for that game and see what I can find. But um, thank you very much uh, for Jamie Bullen for asking that question. Um, the other thing, I don't really have a question from this um, this this viewer, but um, I do want to just say what Philip uh, R. Allen wrote. He said he doesn't have a question, but he wants to personally thank you for all the hours of fun you have provided through your CCGs. He has, at one point or another, played almost every CCG you've been involved in, and his daughter now is starting to get old enough to learn some of them, and he will teach her so she can carry on the legacy and the torch of those games. Isn't that nice? That's very nice. I love hearing stories like that. I, I really like it when kids play the games. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, 
So that that's that's cool. That's very cool. I mean, like I said, I to you personally, like I said, I I played many of your games as well. Even those other ones that you only worked, um, you know, did odd jobs on and stuff like that. And I've enjoyed each and every one of them. So thank you so much for that work. So um, normally I would plug something here. I do want to say check out James's book, Warden. Again, links are in the description. Um, it is going to be fantastic when it launches later this month. This episode will probably be up when it's just about launching. So there is something we do have left to settle, Jim. <laughs> yes great you've been saving the worst for the last have you <laughs> that is the segment of the show the silly segment called kraken questions i have three booster packs here we use select a color i have no idea what card questions are in them they can be random silly questions you and then one rare question which is a more serious question you tell me which color to open and we'll do so my favorite color is red we're gonna do red red it is all right so let's see what Jim gets in the Kraken Questions Booster Pack. Wow, it looks like a regular booster pack. Well done, sir. There is indeed. So these are the Kraken Questions here. We'll start with your first common question. Now, this can be from your experience because you said you played a little bit of Magic the Gathering. This question is, if you could take a color out of Magic the Gathering, which color would you take out of it? Ooh, I would, well... <laughs> Okay, you're going to find this very strange, but I would take the artifacts out of the game. Right. That doesn't not make sense. That's that's interesting. Why? I, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't think the artifacts help the themes of the game at all. And many of those cards are, are extremely broken. I, w I would take out all. I know. I know. I'm probably speaking heresy to some people, and, and I've and I've made he uh, artifact decks because they're so powerful. But uh, yeah, I would take the artifacts out. Well, I think they're problematic so much so that you're onto something there. For somebody who hasn't played for years, Wizards of the Coast has started including color in the artifacts now. Oh, have they really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So now that you can't just play any artifact because they were too broken, they were some of the most problematic cards ever. So now they've included that so that they can start making cards with a little bit more balance. Oh, yeah. yeah my, my favorite card is the land card. Is it Sand Dune? Sandstorm? Sa Sand, sand? sand? No, no, not quicksand. It's a, it's a sand dune card, though. A picture of a sand dune. And it does a point of damage to you if it's tapped. Oh, desert. That's my, that's my favorite card. I have four of those. And I had four of those in every single deck I ever played. So this next one's a little bit more off the wall of a question. Would, would you rather live in a tree house or a boat house? Oh, boy, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd have to be the boat house. Uh, so this next question is a little bit more, and this is, I'm asking, I guess, I guess as one that you've seen voluntarily the most, but which movie have you seen the most? Oh, that's easy one. That is uh, Groundhog's Day. Oh, <laughs> what did you keep waking up and watching it over and over? <laughs> I, the first time I saw it, I thought it was, I, I saw it in the theater and I actually stayed to see it again. And uh, every Groundhog's Day, I watch it. And then probably two or three times a year, I get the urge to watch it again. I just love that movie because I see I see absolutely different things every time I watch it. I see him become a doctor. I see him speak French. I, I just I see him do different stuff. I just I just find it amazing. I love that movie. Bill Murray is fantastic. And my favorite scene is when he walks to get the money from the bank van, like and the guy's just turned around. Yeah, yeah, that's terrific. My favorite scene is the is the shrink that he talks to. And the shrink says, Well, you want to come and see me tomorrow? <laughs> oh my <laughs> I just think it's, and he puts the pillow over his face. I just think it's wonderful. I just, the whole thing is just gigantically hilarious. It is one of those movies that I feel like cannot age. It's almost as perfect as it is. It is. You're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Okay. So now this question is the last question of the booster pack, the rare card in, that you get in every single booster pack. It's a little bit more serious. So which gaming genre which you haven't worked in, would you lo most like to give a try and what appeals to you about it? Okay, first of all, there's only seven gaming genres. Oh, okay, so. All right. So uh, let me just name a couple of them. There's dice, there's paper and pencil games, there's role-playing mm -hmm. games, there is a skill and action games. So there's only mm -hmm. seven of these things. 
I've done a game in every single one of them. Right, right. Wow. So in answer to your question, I, I, I can't design a new one in a genre I haven't done because I've done all the genres. Uh, have you done video games before? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They came out with a Star Wars video game, and the whole script is all mine. Interesting story. Okay, so the, they wanted to do a Star Wars game where you played the bad guy, which I thought was a great idea. And so, so I was asked to do the dialogue for the game based on the elements that were shown in the game and the different encounters that were shown in the game. And in one of the encounters, there's a birthday party for this very rich millionaire who he's giving his daughter a birthday party. And so, and they wanted to make, they wanted to shake up the guy. And so I had the bad guy take a sniper rifle and shoot the birth and shoot the birthday girl's pony. Oh my gosh. And I know, well, you know, talk about, uh, a dramatic thing. I thought it would do the exact same thing that they wanted. No, no, that's too graphic, Jim. We can't do that. So I had, I had, I had to settle for. He called, he called the the millionaire guy up during the the birthday party, and he he said, you know, I could kill your daughter right now. You better start towing the line. So yeah, I've I've done I've done a little bit of everything. That's amazing. So okay, so in lieu of that, other than RPGs and CCGs, which we've talked about today, what is the favorite get your favorite game that you have produced, other than those two genres? Uh, let me see here. I'm a, I'm about to make a terrible mess in my house, but that's okay. I'll do it just for you. Well, I'm honored. Yeah, really. You should be. Normally, I wouldn't do this, but. You've asked an interesting question. Okay, let's see. Oh, yes. Can you see Dragon it? Lords. Can you see yep, it? Yep, we definitely can. All right, this is Dragon Lords. It's a board game that uses cards. Tom Wom and I invented this game. I'm very yep. proud of it. Um, they made a thousand of them and they sold out of the thousand, but then the comp company stopped. So mm. I'm, I'm trying right now to sell it to a different group. Um, and try to get mm -hmm. them interested in it. But it's just just a fun, fun game that I really, really love. And I play it all the time at conventions. That's amazing. So uh, if it ever if, if it ever gets picked up by anybody, let me know and I'll make sure that people who have seen this episode know. All right, that sounds great. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. So Jim, that brings us to the end. Oh my goodness, how, how sad. So that has been the Booster Pack. Thank you so much for watching. We have learned so much today and I would like to thank Jim Ward for joining us. Thank you, Jim. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from Jim. Everybody, remember, keep shuffling. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. And thanks to Jim for telling us those stories. You can check out all of Jim's work that we spoke about during the episode in the description below. That's his uh, card-driven RPGs and his legendary Metamorphosis Alpha remastered game in the big 600-page Warden book. You can also find me through those links in the description. You will see a Facebook and a Twitter page where I am usually pretty active. If you have any feedback or any suggestions for collectible games you want to hear about on this channel, you can let us know through there or, of course, in the comments below. Now, the other thing is, if you want to support the show and see more episodes like this, just subscribe, whether it's here or on your favorite podcast app. There is probably a link to what podcast catches that's on in the description. You can find us there and please subscribe. That's about it. Thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to bring you the next episode of The Booster Pack. Now, I'm going to repeat myself like I do every time. Keep shuffling.